So we now turn to the future. I'm recording this on May 1st, 2020, which is right in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. So hence, I'm recording these from my home. And it's a very difficult time for a lot of people. And it's understandable if people are pessimistic about the future. And this isn't some sort of new feeling at all. It's not like people were really optimistic about the future before this crisis began. But what we're going to be talking about is the future, and, and if we should be optimistic about it in these large breaths of history. Maybe, maybe not optimistic a year from now, but for the whole of humanity, should we be optimistic? For example, take a look at this world population growth uh, through history. So this is a little bit old. The estimates are a little bit changed. Uh, you know, it comes from a study by um, 19, 1994, projects out to 2025. So you know, it's a little obsolete, but the basic idea, most of it concerns the history. So that's more or less uh, right on there. And you see, for most of human history, a world population was pretty stagnant. But for the vast majority of human history, we're talking now, some population growth, but very, very, very little for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And then, just very recently, starting in maybe 1800s, uh, late 1700s, everything changed. Huge, massive population growth. One billion, two billion, three billion, four billion. We're now at over seven billion people in the world. It is a fundamental shift in, in, in the population of the humanity. Some people say this is real problematic. Right? This is unsustainable. This cannot work. Humanity has spent so much with virtually no one. And now to be at maybe what, like 10, 100 times more than historically we've been, it's just impossible. Right? We can't possibly feed ourselves. Right? That was, you know, right when these population was really starting to grow, that's what some economists and some thinkers at the time thought. Right? You can't possibly, right, population grows geometrically, exponentially, uh, but being able to grow enough food that has diminishing marginal returns, right? You lose, uh, you use uh, less and less good land, and eventually the world will start, right? This is what Thomas Malthus said. And so a lot of people claim that humans are just too dangerous to exist, or at the very least, humanity's population is just unsustainably high. Right? There needs to be fewer people. No one's necessarily suggested we start killing people, but as far as just the Earth has a carrying capacity, quote unquote, and that we are in danger of exceeding it, or we've already have. The question is, are they right? And the answer to that question is to First, tackle a different question. What do we mean by too many? So let's play a little game. Who do you think the greatest person is who ever lived? Right. Hands on the best person. Right. Now, when I do this in class, I usually pull the audience. And you know, these are some of the names I get. I often get religious figures, too. I tend to ask people not to include religious figures because it gets... Dicey as far as like the greatest person, right? Let's try to focus on objective criteria. But you know, we can throw in them as philosophers if you want. The list could be, you know, 10 times as long quite easily. But I say these people are great, they were influential, but the greatest person? No, no, I have an idea for the greatest person. This guy. This guy is the greatest person of all time. Do you know who he is? You should know who he is. He's Norman Borlaug. That's right. That Norman Borlaug. You have no idea who Norman Borlaug is. I don't. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So, this concern about too many people in the world is an old concern, right? Thomas Mouth has famously talked about it. But its concern was also reinvigorated in the 60s during environmental um, concerns growing around that time. 
And people saw the world and they said, there's no way that the world can feed itself. They saw that huge population. There's no way the world can feed itself. So people were saying we're going to have mass starvation in that pattern of Thomas Malthus predicted, right? It grows and then... Um, like any sort of biological population, there's too many people, and so people start starving, and the uh, correction mechanism occurs. Back in the 60s, that was the general attitude. Right? There's no way India could feed itself, is what people said. And then everything changed. Norman Borlaug is an agroeconomist, and he is the father of what we know as the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is not about environmentalism, per se. The Green Revolution is about a shift in agricultural production that occurred in the 60s and 70s. Wheat is a tricky crop because its seeds, the part that you eat, is at the top of the stalk. And if you increase its yield, the stalk falls over and rots the ground doesn't work. But if you could breed a stouter uh, wheat, shorter, but with a stronger um, stem, it's, uh, the, the seeds, the food part is lower, so it won't fall over, and because it's stronger, it won't fall over. High yield, what's called dwarf wheat. Ideally, we disease resistant. This is what Norman Borlaug bred. He developed this high yield wheat and he introduced it to Mexico and Pakistan and India. This was revolutionary. This changed everything. In 19, uh, between the years of 1965 and 1970, Wheat crops doubled in a five-year span. And then he did the same thing in Africa in the 80s. And he developed strains and worked with people to develop uh, high-yield strains too of rice and uh, brought that green revolution to East Asia. Very quickly, the world could feed itself. And when he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970, which... When you think about how what he would do later in, in, in Africa and so forth, that's still relatively early in his work. When he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, he was credited for saving one billion lives. That graph I showed you. Yeah, that one. If it wasn't for Norman Borlaug and others like him, it would drop it a whole billion less. Obviously, any sort of activity like this is the result of lots of people working together. But Norman Borlaug was the guy. He was the most important person in this process. As great as these other people are, this man saved a billion people. A billion people. Not even close. It's not even close. This is this is why these conversations about too many people in the world are so fraught with problems. Because the people who always say that there's too many people in the world are coming from a biological background. They look at, at, at animals and they see them follow these predictable patterns and they think people must be the same way. But people are not like other animals. People have ideas. People change. People are not just mouths and stomachs. We're heads. We're hands. We have economies. And that is a categorical difference which changes everything. Purple is by far my favorite color. And it's not just because it's a cool color, but it's the history. Historically, it's the hardest color to make. In the ancient world, in order to get uh, any sort of purple dye, you had to extract it from something called New York's shellfish. It's, um, you just get 
tiny little amounts at a time. It's a very difficult process. It takes a lot of these shellfish in order to get anything purple. This is why during ancient Rome, purple was reserved for only the senators, only the richest people. It was considered to be the royal color. Right? You have like a little stripe of purple on your toga. That was a big deal. Caesar dropped, draped himself completely in purple. Like, huge deal. This was by far the most expensive color. But then we introduced modern technology, we introduced modern science and chemistry, and now purple is everywhere. I can learn purple. And then I can just erase it just because I feel like it. If this was the ancient world, I would have erased probably a year's worth of wages right there. Ideas change everything. Technology is a kind of idea. Whether we're talking about being able to make purple a fun, but ultimately you know, something else, something less serious, or whether we're saving people's lives with us with a dwarf wheat. When we think about the economics of ideas, remember, ideas are non-rivalrous. In other words, when you learn about something, it doesn't diminish knowledge in the world. Just because I'm teaching you economics doesn't mean I know less economics. It increases the total amount of economic knowledge. When we learned how to make purple, then it became easy to be purple, right? It wasn't some, you know, it wasn't something that when you taught someone, people became stupider about it. It's the same thing with high yield wheat. You know, when Norman Bollard developed it and started spreading it all over the world, that wheat reproduced itself. And just because India adopted it doesn't mean the crops in Mexico fell. Ideas are non rivals Everyone can zoom. It's uh, sometimes you can prevent people from capturing them, right? That's excludability. That's a whole other thing. But the fact that you don't have to reinvent the same thing over and over again, literally reinvent the wheel, changes a great deal. Right? Once invented, it can spread as quickly as people can travel. That's why you have a whole revolution of wheat production during the 60s and 70s. A tiny fraction of time in the whole of human history changed everything. So that's background, but like, how do we get there? Right? How do you get those ideas? And that's where the economics come in. We go back to the first rule of economics, incentives matter. And that is just as true in the first conversation we had, and it's gonna be true right now. Proper incentives encourage answers. In order for us to go through that initial cost of coming up with an idea we to solve a problem, we need to be able to be rewarded for it in some way. We need some sort of incentive. The ability to make purple through artificial means that's a huge incentive because purple before was very expensive and people just like purple. And if you could come up with a way to artificially produce it, then you can uh, get a major advantage. And then it spreads. And there's a tension here, obviously. You go through the whole cost of doing something and then it turns out it's it just spread everywhere. And then the people who didn't uh, have to suffer anything get the advantage. It ends up has the potential of being a, a public good, and like all public goods, ends up being underprovided, and that is a real problem. That's why when we were talking before about monopolies and maybe some good parts about monopolies, and one of the good parts about monopolies is, uh, at least for some monopolies for patents, it tries to correct that by maintaining this incentive to invent, by saying, okay, fine, you invent something, and we will make sure that only you get to use it. We'll hold back on this for a little bit. Because if we don't hold back on this part, if we don't give you a little bit of monopoly power, then we can't have this, and then we don't have anything. So when economists look at problems, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily concerned that, oh, we don't know the answer yet. We're looking at the incentives. Do people have an incentive to solve this problem? If they do, 
then we're like, okay, well, things will probably work out well. If they don't, then we get concerned and we try to think of ways to make it possible. The idea that there will be mass starvation in the world seems unlikely in a world of markets. Here's why. Remember, prices are not only bits of information, they're also incentives. They not only tell pause, uh, what is relatively scarce, they also provide an incentive to adapt to it. This comes from our basics of supply and demand, right? The law of demand. Higher prices means less quantity demanded. Law of supply. Higher prices means more quantity, means a more quantity uh, supplied. So this is a you know, straightforward downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve. It's amazing how as fundamental, as easy, as and obvious as that sounds, people forget it. But if the price of food rises, that creates the incentive to maybe figure out how to like, um, for people to maybe eat food that uh, is, 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 is less costly to produce. So they might eat less meat uh, and they might um, eat something that maybe doesn't require as much inputs, like you know, as many crops. They also encourage people to come up with, to uh, produce more. They might make more land arable. They might try to develop that. They might uh, establish more irrigation. They might just grow more food. They might turn food, turn land that wasn't growing food into growing food now, or turning marginal land, maybe even if it's just pasture land into something. But this deeper point about ideas drives us up to the nth degree because you can also encourage production with ideas. You can encourage production by developing a better wheat crop. Now I'm not saying Norman Borlaug was motivated by higher prices uh, of food when he was developing this semi-dwarf, high-yield, disease-resistant wheat. Uh, at the time, he was working for a nonprofit. But the point is that all those farmers who decided to switch over to this new wheat, they were certainly motivated by profit. And it's true too that companies, a lot of companies develop new technology because they're also motivated by profit. Okay? You don't have a supercomputer in your pocket because people just like being nice to each other and developing things for fun. It's hard to develop new technology. Yes, some people do it out of the kindness, some people do it out of curiosity, that's certainly true. But a lot of technology is also developed and most importantly perfected because of, because of prices, because of that motive. So we shouldn't ignore it. We shouldn't pretend it's not nothing. Right? That technology spreads and comes about because of the market mechanism. So of course we were not going to run out of food. Of course we weren't going to run out of food. Right? As long as markets are allowed to work, and that is an important stipulation, for something like food, which is a private good, excludable, rivalrous, the market works, you know, no obvious externality issues. There's no reason to think that people will come up with new ways to come up with stuff, come up with new ways to produce it, or ways to better it. That is the pattern of human existence. I love it when people say that that's an impossible, oh, you're just assuming people will come up with new ways of doing things. That's humanity. That's what makes us different from other animals. Right? We can invent in a way that's faster than mere evolution can justify. This leads us to our second name, Julian Simon. Julian Simon was an economist who argued with the people who said the humanity is going to end, that there's going to be too many people in the world, that we're, you know, we're all just going to roll over and die out of starvation. He said, no, 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 no. Prices incentivize people to act. Prices convey information. As long as the market works fine, people will invent new things. We're not going to run out of food. We're not going to run out of oil. We're not going to run out of coal. And he meant that literally. Julian Simon argued that resources are infinite. And yeah, I meant that. Infinite. I meant that literally. He meant that literally. Now, He's not arguing that the physical amount of something is infinite, that the earth is literally it goes on without end in that like sense of infinite, like in the sense of like cosmic infinity, that the universe just keeps going and going and going. 
he meant it more in that technical definition of infinity. He said there is no carrying capacity. There's no carrying capacity of the earth because we don't even know what that means. What does it mean for something to be finite? Well, for something to be finite, it means it has to be bounded, or countable. And if you recognize that, then you have to recognize that the evidence suggests resources are not finite. They are infinite, right? No one denies the physical amount of oil is finite, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what we care about. What matters is what we use. For example, let's think about oil. There's a certain amount of oil in the, in, in, on Earth. People will then say, well, if we keep using this amount forever, then this is when we'll run out. But we won't keep using that same amount because new technologies will change, prices will change. Right now, of course, oil prices for, for some oil was negative for a little bit. Uh, some oil was negative. So low. Right, oil prices have completely collapsed. We don't use that much oil right now because of the crisis. But it's deeper than that because what oil is changes. So for a very long time, there's these, these um, we, we didn't think that we could get some oil out of the ground and just wrote it off. Well, that doesn't count. Right? We can't get that. But then someone developed fracking. Fracking has problems as a technology, but as far as being able to get oil out of the ground before we didn't think we could. Well, now how much is there is a fluid concept. People said, oh, we know how much wheat we can grow, but then technology changes everything. So when he says resources are infinite, he's meaning that in that literal sense, like we can't assume that we know how much we're gonna use and how much there really is available. Because at the end of the day, ideas are the ultimate resource. That's what matters. Ideas change everything. Ideas turn, you know, oil used to be considered a nuisance. It used to be something that farmers would occasionally stumble upon, or, you know, the oil comes out of the ground, gets all over everything. Strikes a habitat, they're like, ah, I hit oil, this is so annoying. It used to be a problem. And then ideas changed everything, and then it became something that people really wanted. Julian Simon's book is called The Ultimate Resource. And he argues that we shouldn't think in terms of, of this you know, straightforward calculation, thinking like an engineer, we should think like economists when we talk about carrying capacity or we talk about thinking of the future. And he gives some context. In his book, he goes through some of the scares that people have had over the years. It's not merely food, like this is some new thing that Thomas Malthus came up with. And yeah, I want to say 1790. No, 1798, here it is. This isn't some silly idea that Thomas Malthus, like this is some, some new idea that people have come up with. People have been always concerned about running out of one particular resource or another. For example, people were once concerned about running out of copper in the, in the ancient era. Then they came up with bronze. Then they were concerned about running out of tin. You know, tin is used to make bronze. And they came up with steel. People were concerned about the disappearing force in Greece in 550s BCE. Disappearing forests in England in the 1500s, coal and food in the 1800s, oil in the 1850s, uh, rubber and timber in the United States in 1900s, rubber again in 1920s, rubber again in 1940s. That rubber one is really neat because you see it in the 1900s, 1920s, 1940s, what was going on during that time. So 1920s, obviously, with expansion, but 1900s. It was concerned about running out of rubber in part because of using of wars, especially in the 1940s. And so that created the incentive to come up with you know, artificial rubber rather than getting it from trees. Now we don't care about rubber. No one talks about running out of rubber. 
people concerned about running out of metals and food and plant variety in the 1970s and now. And all of these concerns, all of these doomsdays don't happen. They don't materialize. In fact, we're going to go even farther. Remember, think about prices. Prices convey information. So when you see a high price, that tells you something about its scarcity. When you see a low price, that tells you something about its scarcity. And, when, and one of the big themes of, of the ultimate resource is that he notes prices for a lot of things that people are concerned we're running out of are falling. Falling prices indicate lower levels of scarcity. As prices are falling, even as population is rising, according to the naive predictions, then that should mean that prices should rise, right? As population rises, people are consuming more things, so that means the price should rise. But again, the demand curve slopes down, the supply curve slopes up, and when you throw in the technological shifts that shift the supply curve down, you can increase your quantity and get a lower price. Scarcity of a lot of things is decreasing over, over the long run, not increasing. That maybe fueled by people's energy and, and ambition and thoughts and ideas, that resources really are infinite. And that the problem isn't that there are too many people, but that there are too few. Thanks.